Welcome to episode 219 of the Scarlet Faithful Podcast. I'm Aaron Brightman coming to you on Monday, November 20th, Thanksgiving week, three days away from Turkey Day, and this Saturday, Rutgers on Senior Day, the last game of the regular season at SHI Stadium hosting Maryland in a big game for both programs. Both programs are six and five and three and five in the Big Ten. Uh, so I want to discuss the last few weeks, the current state of this team, uh, where they stand, uh, what this game means, and then also um, the senior class, which Greg Schiano did touch on today in his press conference. Um, and what this, you know, to get to this point going into Saturday and, and kind of how it's the end of a journey of quite a journey for, for a class that has done a lot for Rutgers football. So starting just, you know, the last three weeks, obviously disappointing results, extremely hard schedule. Coming off the bye week, you know, I tweeted at some point or written all as well, uh, you know, Rutgers had the number one hardest schedule remaining per pro football focus going into November. And the last three weeks proved that. I mean, they played Ohio State, Iowa on the road, and then Penn State on the road. All teams currently ranked in the top 16 of the AP. Or AP came out today. It was even more so top 15. And, uh, you know, that's brutal. And Rutgers represented really well against Ohio State. They probably had their worst game of the season at Iowa. And the defense played pretty well against Penn State. I got a lot of pushback, but I thought Gavin Williams had played uh, – uh, one of his better games against Penn State. And for a lot of reasons, they lost that game going away. But that does not take away what's happened as a, as a body of work, right? If you look at the way the schedule's shooken out, if you reverse it, and, you know, there's I'm not going to get into semantics of, you know, I'd argue that playing Northwestern on the, on the first game of the season was fortuitous versus having to play them now. They're not bowl eligible. They've been on a roll. Um, but if the results that have happened, right, all still happened, but you flip the order, everyone would be thrilled right now. So the fact remains that Rutgers exceeded expectations by many people within the sport, within the conference, within the fan base, by being 6-2 and two at the end of October. Some fans thought, and expected at least six wins and expected them to win those six games. So if you did and you predicted it, you know, hats off to you. But just because they lost these three games doesn't negate that progress. It, it adds frustration. It brings disappointment. Everyone has a right to be frustrated and disappointed after the last three weeks. I thought the Rutgers played really hard. They made too many mistakes. But they also show progress in certain respects. We know about the Ohio State game. I thought they showed a lot of progress there. Just the fact that they were able to match up physically. I think they have taken a little bit of a toll now. And I think that's my biggest concern going into the Maryland game. How physically able is this team as a whole? The bottom line is when Greg Schiano got back to Rutgers in December 19. The talent and depth level of the roster was nowhere close where it needed to be. And it's still a work in progress. He's called them a developmental program many times, and that's true and fair to say. Uh, and the guys that stayed that were already within the program when he got here and now seniors in their you know, fourth year, fifth year, they've done a lot. And... I think that that progress, while you can have frustration and disappointment based on the last three weeks, that can't take away from what those seniors have meant to the program and what this team can accomplish still this season. If you win on Saturday against Maryland, right, you finish ahead of them in the Big Ten East standings, you finish in fourth place, you finish with a winning record overall, and you finish with the most Big Ten wins you've ever had as a program since joining the league in 2014, which would be four. They're three and five right now in the league. 
That's what they were in 2014 when it was just an eight-game schedule. They've won three games two other times before the season. Saturday's huge. It's a huge statement. And and for any other reason than just wanting a senior class to go out on top in their last regular season game, their last home game, to do it against Maryland, and to, to make history for the program would be – very sweet to see and something that obviously all Rutgers fans are rooting for. Shiano, you know, talked about Maya Nahana too, Deion Jennings, Johnny Langan. I have both of those guys on the podcast recently. You could watch those and listen to those about, you know, all the things they've said about the program. Mayan came on right before the season. Johnny came on after the bye week or during the bye week. And, um, you know, he even mentioned case on Abraham, who's gone through a bunch of injuries, hasn't been the same player, but there's guys that have really given a lot. And and I think this team as a whole, just in the last three weeks, and if you look at Penn State, I mean, I don't think enough attention is being given to the fact of how many guys gutted it out on Saturday. You know, and people will say, oh, well, you're making excuses for them. Well, it's, it's I mean, if you want to call that an excuse, fine, but it's, it's a fact, right? If you've ever played sports, it's just a factor. You can't, it, you don't prop it up as an excuse, but you can't ignore it either. Right. And so many, I mean, you had six starters questionable going into that game. You had a lot of guys who left that game. You had a lot of guys that stuck it out. So yes, that's a big question for Saturday against Maryland is how many are going to be available? How many are going to be able? Um, and what kind of fight are they going to be able to put up? And last year was disappointing. You know, Maryland really blew the doors off the game in terms of blowing Rutgers out. It's been the last couple of games. Uh, they beat Maryland in Shiano's first season back. And that's when the Maryland team was really beat up in injuries that year. So I said, you know, throughout for a while now that I thought this matchup was very much going to be determined by which team was healthier. And, um, you know, Maryland's going through some things as well. They, they put up a pretty good fight against Michigan. And they've looked better the last two weeks than they did uh, kind of mid to late October. So that doesn't necessarily mean anything. I, I've said from the beginning, I think Maryland, you know, has more talent at the skill positions. I think Rutgers is better in the trenches. I think the offensive line of Rutgers is definitely going through some stuff just in terms of depth and injuries. So that's going to be really critical. But I think if you want to really look at it objectively, Rutgers certainly made too many mistakes and missed opportunities, right, against Ohio State, Iowa, and Penn State. They definitely played their best against Ohio State in terms of the last three games. They played their worst against Iowa. They had some positives against Penn State, some negatives. And at the end of the day, they all fell short, right? You're 6-5. and five. You're going to a bowl game no matter what. I know a lot of people resigned to the fact that it's the Penn Strip Bowl. And I have to say, and I know it's social media and everything, but please don't complain about whatever bowl game happens. Like, that's just ridiculous. This program hasn't earned a bowl berth legitimately since 2014. You can't complain about that. I mean, you can. You can play about anything you want, but you just look silly when you do. And... The bottom line is no one could argue with the fact that Rutgers football is not where we all hope they will ultimately be. And that as a whole, this season isn't good enough in the long term. But they've achieved all their top line goals that they went into the season and pretty much needed to to keep things on solid footing. Right, Shiano, I think exceeded expectations year one and year two. Year three was a step back. He needed to step forward in year four, and they have. Not as much as everybody hoped. Not as much as potentially they could have had they taken advantage of some opportunities, had they executed better, had they limited mistakes better. But I think we've seen a very – their wins and losses are very indicative of where this program is at. They've beaten all the teams they've been favored against, all the teams on paper that you said they, they should win or could win. And other than Wisconsin, 
They've lost to four of the top 15 teams in the country. And yes, Rutgers has lost 40 straight games to ranked teams dating back to 2009. I want to go through it at one point, but I'd say about half of those are against Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State. And, you know, this will get me bowed too, but I, I really respect I really like Steve Politi. I know that he wrote that article, you know, saying that Rutgers having, you know, such futility against the big three, you know, is, is a big statement of where they're at in the Big Ten. But I, I honestly disagree because how Rutgers does against everyone else is really going to ultimately determine their ceiling year after year. Yes, you want to get those games, but on paper, there's no comparing Rutgers to Penn State, Michigan, and Ohio State. And, you know, I was laughing. I got a good laugh out of our old friend Stuart Mandel who tweeted on a Saturday or Sunday about, you know, college football is traditionally all about chaos. That's an absurd statement. It's not. It never is about chaos. It's one of the most predictable sports there is uh, because the Blue Bloods always win. Look at who's won the national championship the last 20 years, who's been in the college football playoff the last 20 years. It's, it's a variation of the same 8 to 10 teams. And Ohio State, Penn State, well, not Penn State, they haven't been in that conversation, but Ohio State, Michigan trade spots all the time, right? They were both in the playoff last year, and they're both in contention this year. And I actually tweeted at him because Jackson State, owned 5 Jackson State, upset Missouri, 22-point favorite at Missouri in college basketball this weekend. That's chaos. That's chaos. And listen, People, some people like college football better, and that's fine. Some people like college basketball better. But the bottom line is, I think that when progress is made, when steps are taken, in college football, you know, it's very hard to take multiple steps in one season because of that stability at the top. And to break into that top, it's going to take a lot. So for me, Rutgers, you know, if, if, if half of those ranked wins over the last 15, 13, 14 years are against Michigan, Ohio State, and Penn State, that doesn't really bother me as much. Yes, they've had opportunities to win, and they beat Michigan once. But, you know, it's the, it's, it's the ranked losses against teams that you figure are programs that you hope that Rutgers is better than, right? And, you know, Iowa was an example. But in hindsight, I mean, looking at Iowa – they don't get enough credit as a program and the consistency they've had as a winner and how they do it and how tough they are. And I, you know, I think it's, and Shiano even talked about it a little bit that week. I mean, if Rutgers became similar to Iowa in their consistency in terms of how they develop players and, you know, they, listen, it, it is a myth that they only get three-star recruits. That's not true. They do have four-star guys on that team, uh, you know, a good amount, but they develop, and that coaching staff, obviously, with Kirk Ferentz. So, yeah, if Rutgers became Iowa of the Big Ten on the East Coast, no longer East and West, of course, but, yeah, that would be amazing. So I think it's all in context, all in perspective. And it goes back to the senior class and how much they've given and how much they deserve a proper tribute and salute this Saturday. And the ultimate send-off, the ultimate payoff would be beating Maryland at home, going to seven and five, first winning record in, in nine years, probably improve their bowl position, uh, finish with the most wins in the Big Ten since joining the league, finishing ahead of Maryland, clear cut fourth place. And people say, Oh, you know, that's a loser mentality, finishing fourth in the East. Well, finishing fourth in the East is pretty damn good. And it'd be the last time ever. So that could be that would be satisfying. And, you know, it's hard to argue that it's not the best division in college football. So if Rutgers finished fourth and lost to the top three, you know, that Wisconsin game obviously is one you'd like to have back. They also didn't play them before the downfall when they, you know, lost Tanner Mordecai. Rutgers had some, you know, good breaks with the schedule, playing Northwestern early. They've had some bad breaks playing Wisconsin before Tanner Mordecai went down. But it's all relative. It all shakes out. At the end of the day, I think this team is what it is. They beat all the teams they were favored against. 
They lost all the teams that were underdogs. Um, that's kind of where this program is. Middle of the pack, getting there, not there yet. Thank you to the senior class. Everyone deserves, everyone owes them that. And I hope after, you know, the week goes on and everybody stuffs themselves with turkey and has some wine and beer or whatever, you do take a step back and just realize that, yes, it stinks that they lost out those last three games. They could have potentially won all of them. It would have made the season. It would have made the decade. It would have made everything. It didn't happen. But there's still a lot of positives happening. The recruiting class is ticking upward. And it's time to give thanks this week. It's Thanksgiving, but it's time to give thanks to the senior class. And just the fact that, you know, they all bought in to what Shiano was pitching and they believed and think about all the senior classes recently that had, you know, a lot of good players, a lot of great character, you know, men of character that weren't able to accomplish this. You know, this is for them as well. Uh, you know, I, I, I think back to, you know, JPO and, and, and Darius Hamilton and how their careers ended. And unfortunately those teams weren't good on their, the end of their careers. And it was sad. It was sad and this should be a happy occasion. And even if they lose on Saturday, yes, be frustrated, be upset, be disappointed. That's progress in and of itself as well. And then you have the bowl game with a chance to get healthy for a month and establish a winning season for the first time in nine years. So those are my thoughts on this team, on the senior class, on what's happened the last month. It's progress that everybody's upset and pissed off. It is because in the past, a lot of people would have checked out. There would have been indifference. There's nothing worse than indifference when you're rooting for your, your team, or your school, because that means bad things are happening. There's no hope. There's legitimate hope now. And we've all been disappointed because we thought more success was going to happen this year. It didn't happen. That's college football. But this program is positioned for more success moving forward. And it's about Maryland this Saturday. And it's going to be a really good game, I think. We'll have plenty more. I'm previewing the game. I'll have David Anderson here uh, to do that with me. And as always, thank you for listening and watching to the Scarlet Faithful Podcast.